Hi, I'm Zach Waters, and welcome to another episode of What The Gaffes Stop Photo Talk, where I chat to photographers about their life and connection to the world through photography. I take on issues that stir my passions about the state of humanity and our world, and I deeply believe in the power of still images to change people's minds. I'm driven by this fact that the work of photojournalists and documentary photographers can have a positive impact on the world. The access people give to their lives is precious as well as imperative for this important work to get done. Their openness brings with it a tremendous sense of responsibility to tell the truth, but to also honour their stories. Some really thought-provoking words from Ed Cashy. You can see them words on his website, edcashy.com, and I'll put the link to his website and lots of other stuff on the information part of the podcast. I was really excited when Ed said he would have a chat with me. It's a long time coming. Ed's CV is as long as it gets as a photographer. He's dedicated the best part of 40 years in pursuit of telling stories, whether it was working for National Geographic or work off his own back, or in collaboration with his wife, Julie Winokur, who in herself is a writer and filmmaker. And together they form Tokenized Media, where they write, direct and produce a number of short films, curate exhibitions, publish books and other multimedia pieces. Together, Julie and Ed started a long-term project together in 1995 called Aging in America, The Years Ahead, where they collected stories and personal histories where Ed produced a series of beautifully observed black and white photographs of ageing Americans, over 65s. Little did they know in 2006 that this project would be the groundwork for their next adventure, which came about with both Julie and Ed having to relocate across America and to now look after Julie's father. The project, which was born out of this scenario, was the Sandwich Generation. We moved from San Francisco to New Jersey to... uh to take care of Julie's father, who was 82 years old at that time and was starting to have dementia and Parkinson's and basically couldn't live alone anymore. And so we moved him, you know, we got a house here in Jersey, we moved him in. And then amazingly, literally like the week he moved in, we got a commission from msnbc.com to do something on what's called the sandwich generation. This is 2006. So anyway, so we decided there was no way we had the wherewithal at that moment to report on someone else's life because we were going through it ourselves. Our children were 10 and 7 at that point. Anyway, what was interesting was um, for me was that, you know, having cameras all over my house, video cameras, still cameras, it allowed me to create a, a certain amount of emotional distance from what was actually going on. It was very interesting to observe that. I mean, obviously I would drop the camera if Herbie was his name, if Herbie needed anything or, you know, the family needed anything. We talked about his working life as a National Geographic photographer. I benefited also to learn how to edit your work, yeah. you know, how to create a visual narrative. Because of the way you edit with the geographic where you literally, the film is numbered from the first to the last roll. So you literally go from the very first frame to yeah. the very last frame in chronological order. So you, you get to learn, you're naked. You get to learn about like, what a, first of all, what a dumbass you can be sometimes. <laughs> we discussed his chronic kidney disease project, CDKU. Uh, through seven. And then, um, you know, to go to Nicaragua, this was uh, January of 2013, to work on this little known disease I'd never heard of. Uh, and then, but it was a case where when I got there and I saw what was going on and literally every single day in this town of Chichigalpa, in Nicaragua, there was a funeral for a sugarcane worker who had died of this disease. And it was one of those moments where, you know, as a journalist, you were a documentarian, you're like, wow, usually you have to scratch and work so hard to find the evidence. And in this case, it was just in front of me every day. And it was that that moment I resolved myself to say, this will be my next personal project. I also found out he likes cricket. Is it cricket you're going to see, or is it? Oh, listen to you. <laughs> Although I will tell you, uh, in 2007, I was working on a huge project in India and this 
amazing Indian man, Vinay Diddy, who is my producer. I hate to use the word fixer, but because he's way beyond that. But yeah. You know, every night after long days in the field, we'd go to our hotel and he was an avid cricket watcher. And he taught me to understand and appreciate cricket, especially as someone who was like, you know, who had like baseball in my (laughs) genes, you know. So I was really happy when he found the time in his busy schedule to have a chat. The day came and he asked him what he was up to. So today I'm in uh, Montclair, New Jersey, which is 12 miles west of New York City of Manhattan. And uh, I just arrived uh, about two hours ago from Amsterdam. I've been there for the last uh, week. Bit of jet lag? Uh, I don't know yet. <laughs> and then, but freaky thing is in two hours, I have, I'm leaving to go with my daughter to a Yankee game. So in uh, Yankee Stadium, with you know, baseball game. So it's pretty surreal i assume i will not fall asleep during the yankee game but it'll be nice to be with my daughter that's for sure that's baseball it's a bit like cricket isn't it yeah it's a little faster than cricket but i guess <laughs> other sport it depends if you understand what what's actually going on you must be used to all the traveling though you've spent your life doing it yeah i mean for the last <clears throat> excuse me for the last 40 years i've spent more than half of my life on the road you've got some good air miles then yeah, I have some good air miles. I've used it up for some good stuff too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what have you been doing in Amsterdam? Is it seven related, world um, class related? Not directly related to seven. I'm um, so my wife Julie Winoker, who uh, is a filmmaker, a writer, and also a frequent collaborator uh, with me or me with her. We're planning on moving to Amsterdam in September for a few months to uh, just have a bit of a sabbatical from life here in America, but also to possibly kickstart some, some, a couple of ideas, uh, one of which would involve uh, the Seven Foundation, if all goes according to plan. Um, yeah, so we were doing a little, you know, recce, uh, scouting mission, meeting with people. Uh, we love Amsterdam, you know, the Dutch, uh, the whole vibe it, there. It's is, a great place, isn't it? It's really great. Really, It really great. is. Yeah. I saw the collaboration you did on the Sandwich Generation with your wife. Yeah. That was really interesting. It was must have been quite hard work doing that. Yeah, well, you know, it was interesting because up until that point in my career, which would have been, you know, a good 20, 25 years into it, I had never really turned the camera on myself for my own life, you know, that mm. that was sort of, that's one of the things about being a photojournalist and a documentarian is, um, you know, generally you're not a part of the story, you're not the story. So the Sandwich Generation, that project in particular was was very interesting. It was a bit of a, not a test, but it was, uh, what, it, what it showed though, that was interesting is, you know, so we we moved from San Francisco to New Jersey to, uh, to take care of Julie's father, who was 82 years old at that time and was starting to have dementia and Parkinson's yeah. and basically couldn't live alone anymore. And so we moved him you know, we got a house here in Jersey, we moved him in. And then amazingly, literally like the week he moved in, we got a commission from msnbc.com to do something on what's called the sandwich generation. This is 2006. So anyway, so we decided there was no way we had the wherewithal at that moment to report on someone else's life because we were going through it ourselves. Our children were 10 and seven at that point. Anyway, what was interesting was um, for me was that, you know, having cameras all over my house, video cameras, still cameras, it allowed me to create a, a certain amount of emotional distance from what was actually going on. It was very interesting to observe that. I mean, obviously I would drop the camera if Herbie was his name, if Herbie needed anything or, you know, the family needed anything, but that other than whatever, something that required my assistance, I was able to kind of gain that, I don't know what you want to call that distance, that perspective. Distance, yeah. Yeah, you know, this sort of outsider's view, but within my home. And I had never experienced that before. There's a different barrier there, isn't it? I guess when you're working outside of that and you're on an assignment, when somebody needs assistance, you don't necessarily drop the camera and help, do you? Because you're there to capture something. And quite an interesting perspective that with the emotive strings kick in that you're obliged to go and help your father-in-law. Right, right. Do you know what I mean? It's, oh, absolutely. It's... And and what happens when I'm with strangers or, you know, folks who are not in my family and I'm in their lives documenting it and dwelling in their lives, you know, then it's more of a, 
like a judgment call. It's a moral, ethical, mm. human call. And man, I, there are many times, well, when we were working on the project on aging in America, you know, there were times where I helped change, you know, the diaper of an 80 year old or, 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 you know, whatever it was that, you know, help, help them in some way. Yeah. But unlike family, or super close friends or whatever, which are kind of like family, you know, I, you have the choice to not help, but when it's family, you'd be, it'd be mm -hmm. pretty messed up if you didn't. It's an interesting debate that, isn't it? As a, a journalist in the field, you have to stay in the middle. And I think things like with your age project, it is nice to cross that barrier to help. Sometimes you, you need to feel and justify a little bit why you're there and you can help physically you don't always have to be in the in the center whereas if you're in northern ireland and you get involved in something you just can't do that yeah no it's so true and i find that or i found that as i'm you know getting older not just in terms of my age and ex life experience but as a documentarian i find i'm moving more in the direction of if i'm in a situation with anybody and they need my help increasingly my first instinct is to help because after doing so much so much work so many stories making so many images um obviously i'm still devoted to that craft and that purpose but sure. there is that part of me that the human part that increasingly kicks in because and you're sort of alluding to it like you better be able to justify why you're in these people's lives is that you know as time goes on you you realize sure I, you know i've done work thankfully that it had some impact but the most impact you can have on some level is that on an individual's life it's interesting you talk about you not being sort of the center focus of the camera and in some contexts i think a lot of your work you're showcasing now is a lot of investigation into the way you took pictures in the past in the stories you're, you're sort of trying to find a little some different answers in your work and you can see that in some of your publications the way you've worked and the way you've reinvented the triptych series your california is what's the california series called where cali years the cali years you've gone back and revisited you no it's it's very true and i would say Abandoned Moments, my new book, is kind of a, well, if you take the Cali years out of it, is, is the Abandoned Moments is sort of the last in what I consider a mid-career trilogy of books. Yeah. Three being the first one on triptychs and then photojournalisms, which was based on almost 20 years of journal writings to my wife, you know, from the field. And now Abandoned Moments, these are all books and Cali years that are really kind of looking back at not just trying to make sense of it, but also drawing new conclusions or new observations about what I've done. Yeah. And I I go back to this amazing quote, and I, I'm not going to, I don't have it verbatim, by Don McCullen, a, yeah. you know, amazing British photographer and war photographer, where I remember there was some lecture, I was at a lecture and he talked about how he would be, you know, lying in bed at night in his country home, wherever Surrey or wherever it is, and he would hear his negatives talking to each other. I can't remember, that was maybe 20 years ago I heard that, or 15 years ago. But ever since then, in some ways, it kind of like opened up my mind and my heart to that idea that, you know, 30, 40, now 40 plus years of work that I've been fortunate enough to accomplish, there's so much there. There, there are these relationships and these conversations, if you like, that are going on amongst my work that are out of the context of, you know, aging in America or oil in the Niger Delta or mm. the struggles of the Kurdish people, you know, because all of my work is predicated, really kind of inspired by issues, narrative, and, you know, very applied kind of focused work. And so there's something kind of exhilarating and freeing being able to look at all that work and decontextualize it and see what new relationships or what things mm. it has to say beyond the specific stories and essays I've done. You focus a lot on sociopolitics with a bit, of, quite a bit of geopolitics thrown in there mm -hmm. as well, haven't you, all for the guys? Yeah, I've always, from the beginning, I had the dual interests of social issues and geopolitics. And yeah. through my different personal projects or commissions I've received or successful proposals, particularly to National Geographic, but other publications and foundations and NGOs, I've been able 
to do a lot of geopolitical work. Yeah, you're talking there about re investigating your archive, and you've done so much work as well. It's actually interesting that you look back at that and, and think, what have I missed in all of this? <laughs> wow. Well, what I've missed is my own life. Yeah. But in terms of the context of some of the stories, the reinvention of the stories, the reinventing some of the narratives within that context, because you have done that because you've moved into film. You've started putting some of your work out in your past essays out as films as well. Mm -hmm. And you've started mixing it as well. I like you've used, do you use cinemagraphs? Is it cinemagraphs the word? Um, I don't know. I mean, we work in, you know, at this point, predominantly motion and, you know, uh, video. But I've seen the way you've mixed some of the still stories. Oh, yes. With some, what looked like cinemagraphs, some like repetitive gifts and yes. stuff like that, and just experimenting. Yes. So yeah. early on, Julie and I worked in what was then called multimedia, which quickly became a useless, not a useless, but a not an, an accurate term. But, um, you know, which is mixing stills and motion and sound and music and so forth, ambient sound and all that. And uh, interviews and so but over time you know we've really i've really shifted to being a filmmaker when i'm working with a video camera yes. or a still photographer but i have done in particular the iraqi kurdistan flip book that was maybe what you're referring to but that was a case where it was basically like a digital flip book and um pretty influential we did that in i think 2008 and um it definitely had an impact. I don't think everybody loved it, maybe, but uh, but it definitely had an impact on at least the small world of photojournalism. I think it's an interesting juxtaposition of, with the Syrian stuff, where you've got the stills, and then you've got these snippets of films. It adds another tension to it. There's something different. I actually quite like it. It's inspired me a little bit, the way you're looking at one thing in a few different ways. Sound is amazing. I think video and adding the, the whole context together with, yeah. with stills is fascinating. Digital's given us that energy to do that. Can you just take me back a little bit? Take me back to where you got your calling as a photographer and what took you on your journey to sort of Northern Ireland, I yeah, guess. Yeah, well, well, really, it, it began, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a novelist by the time I was 16 or so. And then by the time I got to university, I was quickly absolved of the idea that I could, I was a good enough writer to actually, you know, make that work. And I kind of... Um, sort of, I didn't chicken out, I guess, but I was like, whoa, I, what am I going to do after, after college? And so I, I thankfully went to a really good school, uh, the Newhouse School of Communications at Syracuse University in, in upstate New York. And, and it has one of the premier photojournalism programs in the world. And so for some reason, I thought, well, what about photography? It'll let me travel meet people, be engaged with the world and tell stories, which were kind of the elements that I imagined as a novelist, you know, where you'd spend a bunch of years like researching and doing all these things. Then you'd write this book and then you'd sit back and, you know, just sort of like be showered with all the accolades. Ha ha ha. But um, anyway, and, and so, so I thought, well, what about photography? And man, within like two or three months of learning, this is back in like 1976, the most basic black and white darkroom you know, processing, I was, I was just hook, line and sinker. It had, photography had me. It's quite a shift though, isn't it? From not doing it to doing it. Was there something in your brain? Yeah. Getting some vibes from somewhere to give you that, I'm going to look at photography. Well, you, you know, no, I think it was just, I mean, I think I can actually remember the, not the day, but I can remember the moment where I was you know, for anyone who's gone to college and you're in your freshman year, I don't know how it is in yeah. outside of the United States, but, you know, where there's this intense pressure for you at a pretty tender age, 17, 18, to decide your goddamn future, you know, yeah. like, what am I going to major in? And so I was like frantically looking at, you know, the, the syllabus, you know, the books that, you know, of the courses. And, and I saw photography and I saw photojournalism. And I think the other element that's really important to mention is that because I grew up in New York in the 60s and 70s, I grew up like with the sort of breast milk of the progressive movement, you know, the yeah. women's liberation, the civil rights movement, uh, environmentalism, you know, the birth of yeah. all of these, you know, amazing and beautiful things, even though not all of them have turned out the way we might have imagined or hoped back then. But, you know, it was a time of enlightenment. Yeah. And I was like the, a kid, you know, I was 10, 11 years old. So I 
absorbed all that. And, you know, I went to Vietnam War protests in Manhattan when I was 12 years old. I, in some level, I didn't even know what I was doing there. I just knew I had to be there. It was the right thing to do. Yeah. And I think those intentions, those impulses, you know, the political, social impulses were inside of me. And while I imagined I, I, I dreamed of it, of using writing to, to express or report on those things, it ended up being photography. Yeah. But what really got me, besides just the excitement of learning something new, you know, agitating film and, you know, seeing your negatives come out and making prints, you know, that sort of alchemy, that magic. Yeah, the smell of stop off, yeah. Exactly. I mean, that's the magic of analog photography is it's truly alchemy. It's alchemy. It's water and chemicals and poof. Yeah. You have this these magical things for them. But it was learning about photographers like Imogene Cunningham, who at that point was, I think, in her 90s. And she was still like, you know, making pictures of, you know, models frolicking in the Redwoods in California. Yeah. Not that I had any interest in making those kinds of pictures, but what it what it did was it captured my young, unformed mind and my imagination. And I was like, wow. The so dynamics. Yeah. I was able to live that long. I could like do this up until my 90s, I was like, I'm in. I am in. And then the next sort of apocryphal moment, if you like, for me, besides learning about, you know, the masters, Bresson and Cortez and Lartigue and all of them, you know, even Don McCullen, who was probably in his prime then, but, you know, um, Eugene Smith, on and on, Bill Brandt. Mm. It's, it's, it's a, such a long line of, of you know, of Robert Frank, of amazing photographers who was seeing Mary Ellen Mark's book, Ward 81. And it was a black and white book of documentary photographs uh, about a mental asylum in Oregon uh, for women. Mm. I don't know if that what that says about me, but that was the book. That was the body of work where I was like, that's what I want to do. That's who I want to be. I want to dig into, you know, important social issues, spend time and hopefully, hopefully make these you know, beautiful, dramatic, sensitive photographs. And that was really the formation of, I guess, like the pillars of, of um, yeah, my inspiration to then to carry on and make this, this thing called photography, photojournalism in particular, my, um, my life. After college, were you picking up work? What was the route then? Where did the style come from? Because when you went to Northern Ireland, I know you were doing a lot in the 90s. I know you were really prolific with black and white as well. Yeah. You know, you were really covering, I mean, we, we go back to social politics. You were really jumped in there with some of this subject matter. Where was the point from leaving university to going off in the early 90s? And what, what was the build up to that? Well, that's really interesting because when I lecture to students and especially high school students, but, you know, students I've, or, or people, you know, young folks who want to enter this field or in this field, I, I talk about how when I got out of the university, I moved to California, I'd never been there, didn't know anybody, but I just felt I wanted to get away from New York City. And then, you know, this is 1979, 1980. And then all of a sudden I become like this hot Silicon Valley photographer for all the magazines. And so through the 80s, I photographed Steve Jobs maybe eight or nine times, Bill Gates, you know, all of the luminaries of, you know, the founders of Intel and all, all of that. At the very beginning, the first, the first wave of what we called Silicon Valley in the 1980s. At some point, I think it was 1987, 1988, I'm, you know, I'm getting published by all the major magazines. I'm going, you know, being sent around, you know, making a living, all of these things that would sort of be, quote unquote, considered success. But I was miserable because that's not why I wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to be a storyteller. And then I woke up one day and it's like I'm bringing, you know, lights and Hasselblads and doing lit color portraits of CEOs or, you know, shooting in clean rooms. Mm. Nothing against covering Silicon Valley either. It's a super important story. Anyway, so I realized if I was going to, and this is the instructional part I feel for young folks, is if I was really going to pursue my dream, I had to pivot and I had to take my destiny into my own hands. Because at that point, I was becoming known as the guy you'd send around the country or the world to do these portraits of people. And that's not what I wanted to do as much as I enjoyed it. So I decided, I went with a colleague uh, who's actually uh, Andrew Ross. He's from the UK, from Bath, actually, and he'd moved to San Francisco. He worked as a reporter and an editor for the San Francisco Examiner. We went off together to Northern Ireland in 1988, and that's really where my destiny 
changed. That's where the, thank goodness, the pivot happened. And it was the first time where I started to look at my work and I was like, man, there's something here now. You know, like obviously still have a ways to go, but there's something here that's exciting. And thankfully, editors and other people felt the same. And then my work started to get published, especially in the UK, you know, back then, The Independent, The Observer, The Times, all the major, you know, gosh, it was such a rich time in the, in the nine, you know, late 80s and through the 90s, all of Europe, but particularly in the UK, you know, you had four or five mm. weekly, wonderful picture magazines. It's funny, I was just saying this to my wife when we were in Amsterdam this week. It's like, it's like, you know, the Beatles had to come to America. I'm not equating myself with the Beatles. <laughs> you, know, you know, like, you know, whatever. The, yeah, the, the great sure. bands from Britain needed to come to America to make it globally. And I had to go to the UK to make it in America. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, but, um, but um, so then that work in Northern Ireland, I spent about three plus years developing a project looking at the Protestant community specifically. Yeah, yeah. And that, that also kind of um, was, was a harbinger of what was to come that I would, and through even up to this point, you know, I'll often pick a group or I'll pick a, you know, like I'll pick um, some underreported element of a story we think we all know, and then go deep with that to show another side. And that's what the work on the Protestant community in Northern yeah. Ireland was for me. And then it was also the launching pad to then, you know, prove to editors yeah. like at National Geographic and then Life Magazine that I could create a visual narrative. And that was really what changed the course of my life, my career. And, uh, you know, then I was doing, you know, major assignments for National Geographic, most of which I pitched to them. So in a sense, I was writing my own ticket, Yeah, you know, to do the work I cared about. We did a lot of work in the Middle East through the 90s. Um, and then we shifted, of course, to color, color slide work. Um, and uh, yeah, and then, and then the rest is kind of history from there. But always, always, I had a personal project. And that's something I emphasize to photographers. And it doesn't matter if you're doing fashion or you're doing conflict or whatever it doesn't matter but you should always be pursuing something that is your own the protestant work was when i first heard your name the style of work in that series is phenomenal you can see even now how long ago was it 30 years yes everything about it the composition the design of the work everything is spot on you know i remember that body and i remember also the other story you did on the denied as well america's underinsured my point is is that Protestant work, for me, was really brilliant. You were jobbing it between university and the point where you hit Northern Ireland. You've learned your craft there. You don't just come from a jobbing photographer to creating style of work like that. What was pushing your style in terms of, you know, working on the design of your work, working on the way you were shooting? Well, I, you know, probably, you know, I was certainly influenced by certain, you know, by, by a, a sort of a litany of photographers, but, you know, the more, you know, how can I put it from the past, it would have been, you know, Brasson or Robert Frank and, um, you know, Eugene Smith, of course, but then my more contemporaries like Gilles Perez, who's whatever, 10 or 15 years older than me, but, you know, at that time we were working contemporaneously. Um, but Gilles certainly, um, and he did so much work in Northern Ireland, influenced me, you know, in terms of just this dynamic, these dynamic compositions and, and really, you know, incisive moments. So I think, you know, I was sort of conjuring up, you know, the kind of, I don't know, like a menagerie of, of great photographers and great photographs that I had absorbed over, over the years at that point. Yeah. And then, but most importantly, kind of responding in my own way and, you know, again, one of the great and important results or aspects of doing your own personal work is that you can do whatever the heck you want. Yeah. When, when I'm on assignment, when I'm working even on a project for National Geographic that I have pitched to them, my own idea, I still know that there are certain kinds of images that I need to get to satisfy them. Mm. When you're working on your own thing, you can do whatever the hell you want. Yeah. And so that leads to more experimentation, I believe, uh, you know, um, yeah, you know, you kind of there's no safety net in some way. So, but there's also no failure, right? Because yeah. you, if you, you only can fail in your own eyes. So, so anyway, so I think all those dynamics, all those elements blended to sort of give me the inspiration to kind of reach a new level of seeing and a new level of capturing in my work. Yeah. 
Yeah, you had to push the, you've got to push the camera and the eye on them shots. I mean, some of the compositions are amazing. One of my favorite is the two couples kissing in the fire. Yeah. In the background. There's so many great shots in that series. That project always stuck in my head. It was actually later on I realized, oh, the guy shoot color as well, <laughs> you know, because you did shoot a lot of black and white. It's interesting your project on insurance people in America. I found that a fascinating project. The whole thing of health insurance became quite the sort of thing with Obama, didn't it? Yes, yes. It's still a sort of big thing now. And it's interesting with that project when you look back at Denied, because I'm surprised you haven't looked at it again. Are you talking about my Aging in America project? Crisis on America's Uninsured, yeah. Boy, I mean, that's an issue that unfortunately never goes away in this sort of screwed up uh, country we're living in when it comes to healthcare in America. You know, it's uh, where it's so the incentives are wrong. It's, it's a product of capitalism, not just capitalism, but the American version of it, which is somewhat Darwinian and rapacious and... And, uh, and often yeah. doesn't, well, first of all, does not promote the common good. And secondly, gives the, the wrong incentives, you know. So anyway, anyway, so within that context, within that, this universe that we're in here in America with healthcare and health insurance, yes. I have not done anything specifically on it since then. But boy, there's so much work I've done since that project was in 2000. Two, I want to say. It's a subject that we're never very far away from. Especially after COVID and lockdown. I mean, America's really took the brunt of that, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I often thought about that after Obama left the, the COVID situation. I've always expected somewhere along the line you do visit that. That's just me. Yeah. No, and it's interesting. I mean, there's certain subjects or, t- you know, even, you know, the Kurds, uh, yeah. you know, North, uh, Nigeria, oil in Nigeria, there's, you know, there, there are so many, there, my major projects I would love to revisit, but what happens is you start, you know, I get absorbed in other stories. It's, it's, uh, or other issues. And it's, fr- it's a frustrating, it's a frustrating element or aspect of doing this work. Even though I'm a long form in-depth storyteller, even with that, I still am frustrated or I lament that I often am not able to go back and revisit issues that I've uh, that I've already covered deeply, and I'm not sure what that's about. It's partly the the vagaries of of being a, p- a professional and having to make a living, and you know. But it's also you know I'm a lifelong learner, so I get yeah. excited about a new idea, and then I want to or a new issue, and I want to learn about it, try to figure out how to tell a story. So it's almost like with old friends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, um, speaking of which, I the dearest friends Hugh and Jackie in Belfast too. I'm one of the other, one of the things we're excited about moving temporarily to Amsterdam is now we can go visit them. <laughs> so, yeah, wow. Um, yeah. What were you kit were you using then for your black and white? What was your main go to camera and lens? Leicas M sixes, and then I might have like a Canon, whatever. There was all film, so a, whatever the Canon cameras back then were. Through most of the eighties and nineties, I worked with Canons and Leicas. And then after the digital revolution, and I'd say 2002, 2003 is when I yeah. never looked back. I haven't shot film to, since 2003, and it's all Canons. And now sometimes I'll, I've got some Fuji film cameras, which are quite wonderful. They're the poor man's digital Leica. Is that when you really moved into color then? Uh, well, no, I moved into color in, I would say, really hardcore in 1991 with my first Nat Geo project on the Kurds. Up until that point, I was doing a lot of color work for magazines, you know, small stories, portraits, things like that. But it was really 1991 where I, you know, really shifted to doing hardcore color, um, you know, photojournalism and documentary work. Yeah, that was when Borders Bleeds. That was 94. Yep. Were you using E6 then, Tranny? I presume you were with National Geographic, were you? Yeah. Well, this is, I find this funny in the age of, uh, you know, digital cameras where you can put your ISO up to like 3,200 or whatever. Um, you know, my I worked with Kodachrome 200. Whoa, and I pushed it to 360. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, that was the indoor low light film. Yeah. And then in another camera, I would have Fuji Chrome 100 or Velvia, but Fuji Chrome 100, I think Sensi, I can't remember the name of 
but Fuji Film 100A ISO. And basically, that's how I worked for whew, a good almost 15 years. Is I'd have two cameras with those two films, so then I was theoretically able to respond at any moment to any kind of lighting situation. When you were processing the 3200, did you have to write plus four on a lot of your film canisters? No, no, I was pushing the 200 to 360. I'm saying that whatever, like, or, you know, like a stop, a stop and a half. Oh, right, yes, I'm thinking 3200, yes. I was thinking, wow. <laughs> right. That's why a lot of my work back then was handheld at, you know, an eighth and a quarter and a fifteenth of a second. And of course, I was using prime lim- lenses then, so they were faster. It's incredible the tools we have now as photographers. Oh. I, you know, young young or photographers that are just starting don't, don't unless they've gotten into shooting film analog, they don't it's hard to understand how what a profound change has taken place and the technology has made it so much easier. But you know, it doesn't matter what technology or camera you have, it's your, you know, your head, your heart, and your gut yeah. that are really going to determine whether you do great work or not. What was it like working for National Geographic? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's in, for, for some, it's the, you know, it's the uh, Mount Everest of photography. Um, for me, it was, it was obviously incredibly serving and, and amazing. And, you know, I feel so fortunate that I was able to have them, you know, as a, as a consistent client is a dumb word, but, you know, because it was so much about journalism and reporting on the world and very collaborative when I was, you know, when you're in the stable with Nat Geo, it's a whole different thing than being an outsider. But um, so overall, it was incredible. And I, you know, I always say I got paid to learn about the world and I was able to, you know, write my own ticket on a number of projects that went on to be books or, you know, personal work, not just assignments. Mm -hmm. Um, I was able to, you know, explore the Middle East, which my mother and father are born and raised in Baghdad in Iraq. So you know, I was born in New York. I'm a first generation American, but I, I grew up not as an Iraqi American. I grew up as an American kid that happened to have a good suntan, you know, whatever, <laughs> just, uh, you know, that looked a little different. Uh, but, um, you know, when you're in with Nat Geo, in some ways, there's nothing quite like it. But, um, you know, it's also a precarious relationship because it's incredibly competitive and especially as one gets older then you know whether you like it or not you need to make room for the next generations and you know now i don't do very much with that geo so i don't know how they're working but clearly there's no question that the assignments are shorter you know my first two assignments for them were 26 and 25 weeks each wow so it's it's insane by today's standards to think that frankly i wouldn't want a 26 week assignment <laughs> on some level but uh, i'm joking but um anyway so so i got a taste of that kind of like whatever you want to call it sort of the 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 end of the golden age of of that kind of magazine photojournalism um you know now probably the average assignment is 5 to 10 weeks which is still tremendous tremendous and and you can do great great work in that amount of time so, you know, um, it was a great, great, great learning experience. And, uh, you know, who knows, I could still do work with them. But, you know, it feels to me, you know, one of the things that I've experienced, I know I'm sort of jumping all over the place here, but, um, you know, this, the issue of ageism in this profession is quite, quite clear. And I didn't anticipate it or think about it, but, you know, I am I'm now seeing that. And I understand it on some level, you need to make room for, new generations of folks so they can gain experience and and have the opportunities but it's not something i guess i just you're not prepared for it in a way because yeah, yeah. you're cranking i'm in some ways i'm at the height of my powers i i have so much experience all this stuff but anyway so so i've learned to apply all that passion and energy and skill and talent to you know through other means i remember in the mid 90s or maybe yeah about the mid 90s i walked into a room at magnum and I saw all of Steve McCurry's boxes of transparency coming back from an assignment. Man, it was like amazing amount of boxes of ectochrome or cordochrome. Yeah. You used to show me a lot of film then. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> did you take it all out with you or did you get deliveries? How the heck does that work? I mean, in retrospect now with the digital workflow, I, it's horrifying to think the, the chances we took shipping, you know, unprocessed film around the world but yeah, I know. that's what we did you know and and you'd whether thank goodness for you know fedex and dhl 
back then and and uh you know just the good graces of the photo gods that i never lost any film i'm furiously you yeah, know yeah. one would right now um but um yeah and, and it was really flying blind but that's all you knew then so you didn't i didn't look at it like you know now again in retrospect with the with the perspective we have now it seems insane that we would do that you know like a month's worth of work hundreds of rolls of film yeah. we would ship in a lead bag you know from wherever i was in the world syria turkey wherever wherever uh, you know the crimea back to washington dc but again thankfully it worked out and you know the process was also quite educational uh you know i really appreciate that something else working for i did 17 features for the magazine plus some other smaller things over the about a 25 year period so i benefited also to learn how to edit your work yeah. you know how to create a visual narrative because of the way you edit with the geographic where you literally the film is numbered from the first to the last roll so you literally go from the very first frame to yeah. the very last frame in chronological order so you you get to learn you're naked you get to learn about like what a first of all what a dumbass you can be sometimes <laughs> You'd move on from situations that were percolating, but in the moment you were able to realize to stay with it. You know what I mean? Is that I, yeah, yeah. what I'm simply trying to say is that it really taught you the importance of patience. Yeah. You know, and then, anyway, but also just how one photographs and how your mind works. So, in that sense, it's quite a brilliant uh, learning, you know, opportunity. I remember going off to places like Africa and Cambodia and Bangladesh, and I would be like carrying 150 rolls of film yep. with me, and it was ridiculous. You must have been doing trouble. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> or even when I was working on my own project in Northern Ireland, and I'd, you know, I'd show up with 350 rolls of, you know, Tri-X and whatever, yeah. uh, you know, T-Max, whatever the black and white yeah. films I was using in these big lead bags, and you know, it's ridiculous, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I, I think if you saw, I don't know if we would all feel this way, but if I saw a video of like how I was back then, I, I'd be really <laughs> embarrassed. <laughs> it's different now. And also, you know, you'd go out and shoot, you wouldn't see anything. You had to sort of wait till you got home. But now you you can go back to your hotel or you go back to your little bed and you have to sort of look at the edits. Exactly. You have to start worrying about the editing process straight away, don't yeah. you? Yeah. It's 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 quite it's completely different dynamics now. One project you did, which really interests me, is your CKDNT project, which is really interesting on the chronic kidney yeah. problem around the world. Was that a National Geographic project, or was that a personal? That actually was a small commission that um, came to me originally uh, through Seven, and then um, you know to go to Nicaragua. This was uh, January of 2013 to work on this little known disease I'd never heard of. Uh, and then, but it was a case where when I got there and I saw what was going on and literally every single day in this town of Chichigalpa, Nicaragua, there was a funeral for a sugarcane worker who had died of this disease. And it was one of those moments where, you know, as a journalist, you were a documentarian, you're like, wow, usually you have to scratch and work so hard to find the evidence and in this case, it was just in front of me every day. And it was that that moment I resolved myself to say, this will be my next personal project. And that was eight years ago. And since then, and it's not done. I'm, I'm planning to go later this year to Nepal and Qatar to work on a, a new segment of it. Um, also more focused on um, heat stress and, and the impact on workers. But, um, um, you know, I, we've now worked on this project in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Peru, Sri Lanka, and India. So this is sort of my current long-term project. And it's also, it reflects the way I, my, my approach, which is doing more advocacy journalism. Elaborating on the CKDNT for people who don't know, what is it? So um, CKDNT is chronic kidney disease of, of non-traditional causes. So basically it's, um, it's, a, it's an epidemic, it's a health epidemic. And I know this is a really crap time to talk about another health, health epidemic. Thankfully, this one is not killing millions of people, but it's killed tens of thousands of people and sickened hundreds of thousands of people around the global, sort of the equatorial band, the hot zones of, of the world. It's different than 
you know, diabetes, obesity, and high blood pressure, which are the three main causes of chronic kidney disease. Do you know that a tenth of humanity has chronic kidney disease of some kind? And again, it presents itself mostly in, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity. And so this disease attacks a different part of the kidney. It's definitely connected to repeated dehydration, possibly genetic, probably connected to you know, man-made and natural occurring compounds, you know, agrochemicals, yeah. silicates, arsenic, different compounds that attack the tubular part of your kidney. And so what I've resolved myself along with uh, other Tom LaFay, who's a young filmmaker that I've worked a lot with, who's now based in Bogota, Colombia, and then Jason Glazer, who is really the mastermind behind all of this. It, um, he was a filmmaker and he started an NGO La Isla Network, a small NGO, and he has dedicated his life to trying to figure out what are the causes of CKDNT and solutions. And it's very beautiful. And what was it? In two, right before the pandemic hit in early 2020, I went with him back to Nicaragua to work uh, to cover um, what's called the Adelante Initiative. And it's uh, his de- making. And basically, it's bringing rest, water, and shade to the workers in the sugarcane fields in Nicaragua. And wonderfully, I'm happy to report that not only has the incidence of the disease subsided, but also their productivity has increased. So, you know, it's wonderful when you can, as a storyteller or as a journalist, be part of a potential solution to a problem. And of course, it's not because of me, but, but what is absolutely clear is doing this kind of storytelling not only raises awareness among the public, but it brings together the researchers and epidemiologists and healthcare professionals around the world who are studying this disease to yep. create international protocols of research and so forth and so on. So I don't mean to get so wonky here or in the weeds, but yeah. quite frankly, this is why I love doing this work is that you get to become a bit of a little mini expert on a subject that you're hopefully passionate about, in my case I am, and also that this is work that can actually benefit people. It can benefit, you know, particularly poor agricultural workers. So, you know, I'm, I'm um, yeah, for me, this is also the spirit of advocacy work where you're not trying to show both sides of a problem. You're trying to show the problem, but then you also show some possible solution. Is there another side to these workers' lives as well? Because the types of workers which succumb to it, chances are they are probably tied up in sort of modern slavery as well. Well, yes, and you particularly see that in uh, Mesoamerica, you know, Central America, maybe Southern Mexico, where, but certainly in, in you know, El Salvador, Nicaragua, where we have reported on this, when you're paid by how much you harvest, then you're essentially, it's, it's modern slave labor yeah. because that means if you're sick, for a day or a week, yeah. you're shit out of luck. You're not going to get paid. You have, there was no like health care for these workers. It's so messed up. Yeah. They, they work as hard as anybody on earth, and yet their living conditions, they're, they literally, a lot of them look like they were living like in a refugee camp. So it is unacceptable, and that yeah. is part of the motivation and inspiration for doing this kind of work. Um, and then, of course, besides the impact, the health impacts on the individual who gets sick, or dies, there's impact on the family, on the community, you know, and then in a larger picture in a country like a poor country like Nicaragua, you know, it's a strain on their healthcare system or in India, which has, you know, is massive in so many ways and has in some ways quite a, an amazing healthcare system in some ways, but they can't, what was it? We worked in Tamil Nadu. That's a state with, I think, 85 million people. 85 million people in that one state of India. And uh, something like 4% of the population has CKDNT. Do the numbers, man. That's tens or hundreds of thousands of people. And so there's no way that in the Indian healthcare system can, can provide the dialysis clinics and all the care that is needed to you know, support or maintain the, the people who get sick with this disease their lives. So you know, there's broader implications to a disease like this. I think a lot of times it's out of sight, out of mind. But in India itself, there's a lot of slavery. There's a lot of people tied up from generations of families. I just looked at that project and it just sort of tied in with the whole, the workers and thinking a lot of this is going to come from that side of it. You know, it's obvious. Yeah, absolutely. 
So when did you join Seven and how did that come about? Where are you now and what's next for you? Um, so I joined Seven in 2010. They, um, they invited me to apply. I wasn't intending to because at that stage in my career, in my life, I had figured out how to make a living, support personal work, support a family, support a studio. So I was a little you know, hesitant to shake that structure, that paradigm, whatever you want to call it up. But um, at that stage, I felt like, you know, for all I had accomplished, it would be amazing to be part of this great group of photographers where we could collectively do even more together. So that was my, that was the entree into Seven. Thankfully, I was voted in. And then that's been whatever, 12 years ago. And in that time, there's been, you know, tremendous ups and tremendous downs and, you know, pretty traumatic things and a fair bit of toxicity in a collective of crazy people, of crazy photographers. I always say photographers are like feral cats. Anyway, um, but I'm so happy, you know, I'm so, I feel so fortunate that we made it through the hard times and now, you know, we're in a really beautiful position where we've we've thankfully brought in more women and, you know, we're still trying to deal with the diversity issue, both in gender and race, but it's not easy because we can't force people to apply and join. It's, you know, so it's, so it's- You can uh, force me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, but you know, the thing is, and this has happened is we've passed over some incredible photographers over the last handful of years because they were white males. And it's, it's horrible, horrible. But this is the moment we're in where we're trying to address we're trying to address the chorus out there and, and rightfully so, rightfully so that it's crazy that, you know, there aren't more African photographers or, or even in black American photographers or, or British, you know, photographers of color and so forth and so on, you know, and of course women that goes without saying. So what's been wonderful to see in the last handful of years, we brought in, I think seven new women and it's just great to see how it changes the whole, like the whole Dynamics. You know, nature of con- yeah, the conversation is more intelligent. The vibe is nicer. Yeah. It's it's a more loving and supportive community now. And we've basically been able to get rid of all the toxicity. And so while agencies like Seven and Magnum, nor it's possible that in some ways they're anachronistic, you know, they're kind of like it doesn't make sense in today's world on a business practical level, yeah. it, it does provide this tremendous community and support, access to knowledge and experience, and as well as, of course, the production of new work in a communal sense. It's interesting with social media now and the digital age, it has created a lot more community and has brought a lot of people together. And, and I think community now in the next 10 years is going to play a big part of people feeling that they belong to something. And I think in just the way I'm looking at my work, and you obviously look at community when when you're creating your work, Mm -hmm. I I think it's a really interesting word for the next 10 years and how people can come together easier. Forget about toxicity. It's always going to happen, you know. But I think for all the crap what's in social media, there's always something in there which brings people together yeah and you know in a perfect world or like you know when when it's working right absolutely yeah yeah but what i've witnessed while i've certainly witnessed what you're describing you know the positive aspects what i'm also seeing is that now there's like a new kind of tribalism yeah. within our little profession you know our small profession yeah we never sat around as men and said we don't want women photographers <laughs> we always wanted women to be around because it Nice to have that. So besides just the talent and skills and all that intelligence. So anyway, I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but bottom line is that there, I think there's so much anger and frustration with the race issue and gender issue that we're in this period where, you know, the pendulum is almost like violently swinging the other way. And so, you know, I'm just realizing you have to sort of grit and bear it and hope that things level out. But um, but what I don't like is this kind of tribalism where, you know, I don't want, you know, male photographers pitted against female photographers and black photographers pitted against non-black photographers. I mean, that's insane. It's insane. And nobody wants that. Yeah. Nobody wants that. So so that's something that I have to say I'm, you know, I've been struggling with um, in the last handful of years. 
so again, to get back to your positive comment about social media, it's wonderful. You know, it's wonderful what it's been able to do, but there is a downside. Um, yeah. I think you're always going to have that. I think we'll look back in 20 years and see this period over the last five years, for maybe the next five or 10 years is a massive transition period. Yep. Do you know what I mean? I think yeah. we're in a transition now where we are looking back at what we've done, the way we've set up organizations to where we need to go. And you know what? This transition is a good thing for, our, for all its negatives and positives. I think we look back at it. Things have to change and always people are not going to be happy when things like this happen. But we've got to come out of that to look back at it. Oh, my gosh, absolutely. I mean, it's absurd that, you know, when I go to like Perpignan to Visa Pour Limage, you, you really see that how, you know, that we talk about the white male gaze, but that in photojournalism, it's been dominated by the sort of white European male gaze. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with that gaze, by the way. No. Well, when it's done well and sensitively and ethically, right? No. But, um, but, you know, it's crazy. I want to see what, you know, a Vietnamese person or an Indian person or a Nigerian, how they see the world and of any gender or any uh, um, sexual orientation. You know, all of these, basically, to pick up on what you're saying or to kind of reinforce it, is that we're going through this beautiful moment. There are so many more, there, it's, the, the, there's a richness in the diversity of voices. Yes. And so I feel like I learned so much from other folks whose work I haven't had the opportunity to see in the past. Yeah. And as a teacher and a mentor, I particularly get to see it in a very intimate and firsthand way. And I get to even hopefully help them to nurture them along. And, and that's one of the great, great initiatives that the Seven Foundation is engaged in, where we have two academies now in Sarajevo and one opening this fall in Arles in France. And, you know, where these are physical facilities where people from the majority world will get full scholarships to come and study photojournalism and visual storytelling and multimedia and filmmaking and so forth. So we're putting our money where our, where our mouths are and, and it's super exciting. Gary Knight, he's the, the bull behind this, you know, making it all happen. And it's a, so it's a very exciting moment. It's a very exciting moment. It's just that, you know, I don't like some of the negative crap that has yeah. happened. You're just all doing what you have to do next, you know, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And on that note, what are you doing next? What's the, what's next for you, apart from the baseball game? <laughs> next for me? Well, uh, continuing to build on the momentum we generated or initiated it in Amsterdam, um, where we will be looking at a, a, a project that would involve training refugees and immigrants and a project that would report on an aspect of the um, immigrant experience in Holland or Netherlands. And, uh, and then other than that, you know, I have a number of commissions coming up, you know, Julie and I are working on uh, films for Princeton university and uh, New York city department of health, uh, you know, different kind of small films that are all, you know, that are all like advocacy work. Yeah. And then the big thing, which I, I can't talk about, but I'm waiting for confirmation would be for a major publication to make a film that would take us to Qatar and Nepal uh, later this year. So, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of balls in the air. Uh, you know, of course, teaching and mentoring continues around all of the generating of new work. And um, yeah, and that's, and that's where we are. I noticed on your blog, you've got uh, you're advertising for a job as an assistant, for an assistant, I should say. Yeah. Well, if you get me my green card, I'll come and do it. <laughs> what a great job that sounds like it's wonderful well it's exciting and and we'll be i'll be sharing this person will be sharing uh, the workload with the the raw society which is this wonderful it's a couple out of uh, spain um Christel and jorge in there they've managed to create this beautiful company where they basically use photography to fulfill their passions of traveling and teaching. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, then the, this new person who will be a creative director slash studio manager will be working for both me and the Ross Society out of my studio in New Jersey. And uh, we'll, we'll see where that goes. But, um, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a very, a very interesting and exciting time. Well, it looks like a great job. A bus journey on a morning would be a bit long. <laughs> Ed, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. 
really nice listening to the, your thoughts and how you've connected with the world as a photographer, as a human, and the way you're looking at the world now. Thank you. Okay, Zach, thank you so much. Oh, no, it pleasure's more mine, mate. And enjoy your, is it cricket you're going to see, or is it? Oh, well, isn't he? Uh, <laughs> although I will tell you, uh, in 2007, I was working a huge project in India and this amazing Indian man, Vinay Diddy, who is my producer. I hate to use the word fixer, but because he's way beyond that. But, yeah. you know, every night after long days in the field, we'd go to our hotel and he was an avid cricket watcher. And he taught me to understand and appreciate cricket, especially as someone who was like, you know, who had like baseball in my <laughs> jeans, you know? Um, I was a Yankee fan before I was born, I think. But anyway, but it was like, it was so wonderful to like kind of go, aha, so now I understand. <laughs> anyway. Obviously, there's a lot of technique involved with cricket. There's a lot of psychology involved with cricket. Exactly, exactly. Which is why you can only appreciate it if you understand those nuances. Listen, have a lovely weekend. Thank you. If there's anything you ever want to talk to me about and do this again, just give us a shout and we'll jump on it. All right, Zach. Take good care. Pleasure. All the best. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, Ed. Bye.